Aloha and good evening. Thank you for joining us for our Molokai virtual community meeting. I'm Sharon Suzuki, President of Hawaiian Electric's Maui County and Hawaii Island Utilities. I hope that you and your families have been staying well and safe during this very challenging pandemic. We of course would have loved to have met with you in person, but given the requirements for social distancing and for your safety, we decided on this format because it's important to us to remain connected with you. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide you updates on Hawaiian Electric's activities on Molokai, to provide you updates on what we're doing to get to 100% renewable energy on your island, and to introduce you to our long-range planning process and how you can provide input. As always, we want to hear from you, so we've allowed time after our formal presentations for questions and answers. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Mahina Martin, Director of Government and Community Affairs, who will serve as our moderator for this evening. Mahina. We're pleased to use virtual means to connect with all of you and share information and updates. And as you can see from the agenda on the screen, we'll be getting infrastructure project updates from Matt McNaff, as well as information on the electric vehicle charging station and training for our Molokai mechanics. Matt serves as the director for our utilities on Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. You'll also be hearing tonight from Rebecca Deha Matsushima, who is Hawaiian Electric's Director of Renewable Acquisition. Rebecca will be giving an update on our progress to bring more renewable energy to Hawaii and Molokai through the Request for Proposals, or RFP, process, as well as community solar through the Community-Based Renewable Energy Program. Hawaiian Electric has undertaken an intensive planning process known as integrated grid planning. This multi-year effort involves not just industry experts, it brings to the table many stakeholders, including committees on the five islands that we serve. With us tonight is Colton Ching, Senior Vice President of Planning and Technology, who will share information on our integrated grid planning efforts and how you can provide input. We have over 80 participants joining us tonight. Aloha and welcome. As well as those viewing on Akaku, we are live on Facebook and here on our WebEx event. So tonight we'd like to help answer any questions you may have. Shana, we can go to the next slide. We are hosting uh, in multiple ways, but there are ways that you can submit questions. Uh, and we do wanna say mahalo to Akaku for joining us this evening and providing the live broadcast as well. To submit a question during our meeting tonight, if you're joining us on WebEx, please use the Q&A box. It's located by clicking on the options button at the bottom of your screen and just type directly into the Q&A box. If you're watching us on Facebook, use the comment box and via email, send your question to community relations in Maui County at hawaiianelectric.com. We'll be answering your questions during the second half of tonight's meeting. And if we can't get to all of them before we plan to end at 7 p.m., we'll do our best to get a response to you directly. Tonight's meeting is also being recorded for future viewing. We're committed to doing our part to help build sustainable and resilient communities in partnership with the communities we serve. And not just keeping the light on and for businesses and homes, but as you hear tonight, keeping an eye on creating a green sustainable future and a resilient, stronger electrical system to meet your needs. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt McNaff. Matt? Disconnections for those who are unable to pay for their electric bill through September 1st. We halted collection efforts in March to ensure customers' electric service was not disrupted during COVID-19 related orders to stay at home. We wanna work with customers with pass to accounts to find the best options to make their payments manageable. While customers are still responsible for paying their bills, a variety of public and nonprofit assistance, as well as Hawaiian Electric payment arrangements are currently available as a result of COVID-19. You can visit www.hawaiianelectric.com forward slash COVID-19 for available assistance programs. We remain committed to providing a reliable, critical and essential service to all of you. I'm sure not many of you have been traveling to the West Coast lately, but if you had and you looked out the window of the plane, you would not have seen a big, big red extension cord across the Pacific. 
Each island needs to produce all the energy needed by residents, businesses, and our community 24 seven. We take this responsibility seriously as we don't have the ability to simply plug into another state or even another island for help. To ensure we continue to maintain safe and reliable service on Molokai, we're working on several projects to help strengthen the electrical system. Such work includes uh, replacing about 130 poles since 2019. And to pre prevent wind and tree related outages, we're also planning on starting the installation of insulated power lines in certain areas of the east end. Known as the Hendrix Aerial Cable System, these cables consist of three coated conductors uh, attached with polyethylene spacers about every 30 feet along the spans. You can see an example on the slide now. The system does not require cross arms or a neutral wire on the poles, thus reducing visual impact. The cable spacers are specifically engineered to withstand high winds, falling trees, and long installation spans. On the west end, we're also moving forward with system upgrades and we'll start to replace approximately 34,000 feet of underground cable in the Kaluakoi area. And we'll also upgrade aged electrical equipment, including fuses to improve service to this area. This, this work is planned to begin later this month. Encouraging electric vehicle adoption on island also remains part of our efforts to maintain reliable service while safely integrating more renewable energy. More electric vehicles on island that are charging during the daytime hours helps to add energy demand on the island when solar energy is typically abundant. Since installing the EV charger in Kanakakai on December 28th, 2018, there's been over 300 charging sessions. We also just received approval from the Public Utilities Commission for a donation of two used EV Nissan LEAF vehicles to the University of Hawaii Maui College EV Mechanic Training Program. This new program was a result of feedback from the Molokai community when asked about not having mechanics on island that could help service electric vehicles. The donated electric vehicles will give students at the UHMC program hands-on experience with EV maintenance. I'd now like to turn it over to Becca Dehuff Matsushima, our Director of Renewable Acquisitions, who will share more on the progress of our renewable energy efforts. Thanks, Matt. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's nice to be back speaking with you. I wish it were under better circumstances and I could be there in person again like I was last year, but I'm really happy that we're able to leverage technology and, and still get to reach out and provide you updates tonight. Today, I'll be walking you through some updates um, regarding our renewable energy efforts and our, our ongoing um, current RFP, as well as um, introducing you to phase two of our community-based renewable energy program. Before I get started on that though, um, I did wanna provide a quick update on the Molokai New Energy Partners project. As some of you may know, we terminated that project last week, Friday on July 10th, 2020, after the developer was unable to meet contractually agreed upon project milestones. We're currently in a legal proceeding with Molokai New Energy Partners. Even as a developer chose to go to court, we tried to resolve our issues and work with the developer in the best interest of the Molokai community. We're disappointed that the developer was unwilling to meet its commitments to the community and to the company under the agreement. What happens with the Molokai New Energy Project may depend on the outcome of the dispute and whether Molokai New Energy partners um, are still interested in moving the project forward. However, we remain committed to working with the community and developers to ensure that we move forward with our renewable energy efforts and provide an affordable, clean, and reliable energy future. Speaking of which, as I'm sure you're all aware, Hawaii has an aggressive push to meet 100% renewable energy by 2045. As part of these goals, we're required by the end of this year to be at 30% RPS, and there's also interim goals for 2030 and 2040. As you can see on this slide, we're at, uh, we started in 2010 at 9% renewable um, portfolio standards. And in just 10 years, at the beginning of this year, we were at 28%. And in, at the end of this year, we'll be in ex exceeding 30% RPS. So we've really made great progress in just these first 10 years. And by 2030, we actually expect that we'll be um, well over our 2030 goal and, and already above 60%. So you may be wondering how we're going to get to 30% by the end of this year. So that'll come from a, a combination of projects. We had some large renewable projects 
um, solar projects interconnect on Oahu at the end of last year. So the, those projects are now providing energy to the, the grid on Oahu. We also expect a new wind farm and a couple small solar farms to connect to the system on Oahu this year, as well as we expect our Puno Geothermal Venture Plant on Hawaii Island to start producing energy again later this year once repairs from the lava flow are complete. Last year when we met, I spent a lot of time talking about our renewable energy um, request for proposal process. And this process is used to provide a competitive process to select new renewable energy projects throughout the islands that we serve. And the goal of the RFP is to be able to select a project that best meets the needs of the company system, but also provides the lowest cost to our customers. So our current process um, that we talked about last year when I was on Molokai was when we started that RFP and it is currently, um, the process is laid out here in the flow chart. We're in the, the second to last box, the detailed evaluation phase of that RFP. Coming out of that phase, the company has several options. It can select a final project or projects that meet the needs of the RFP. It may seek for information from bidders prior to selecting a project, or it may decide that the process did not result in any viable bids and look at new processes to procure the renewable energy that we're seeking for the island. In order for a project to be selected from the current RFP, it will have to have met all the requirements of the RFP and provide a benefit to our Molokai customers. I'm not able to share further details on the RFP at this time, as it's subject to um, a confidential process under the RFP, but further information will be provided by the company at the conclusion of the process. That should occur later this summer. Moving on from our renewable RFP effort that's in progress, I wanted to next talk about the company's phase two of its community-based renewable energy program. This is an exciting new endeavor, which will also help the company to meet its 100% renewable energy uh, goals. Community-based renewable energy, you may have already heard of it as community solar. And today, throughout tonight's presentation, I'll largely be referring to it as CBRE. You, you've seen solar on people's roofs. You may even know somebody that has rooftop solar. But if you're a renter, for example, you may not have the ability to put your own rooftop solar on, on your dwelling. CBRE is designed to let more people be a part of the solar revolution and save money over the long term on their electric bills. This graphic shows a simple depiction of how it works. In step one, a subscriber organization, which could be a company, a nonprofit, or other entity, and you know, usually will involve a developer, will develop a large scale solar facility on, on the island. In steps two and three, the electricity from that facility will go directly into the grid, just like any other renewable project. So it will serve all of the customers that are on the grid. Subscribers are customers who buy a portion of the output or availability of that facility. In step four, these customers get a credit on their electric bill based on the performance of their portion of the facility. Hawaiian Electric gets information from the subscriber organization regarding who the subscribers are and the amount of credit that that subscriber should be, and then reduces the subscriber's monthly bills accordingly. So over the years, a subscriber will save money just like people who bought rooftop solar. In an effort to ensure that we can get projects on the grid as soon as possible, and given a lot of the feedback that we received from the Molokai community in our last meetings, we've limited the project technology on Molokai for CBRE Phase 2 to PV plus storage. The Commission has set the program size for Molokai to 3 megawatts, and projects can range in size between the smallest being 250 kilowatts up to 3 megawatts, so we're looking for a total of three megawatts. So the projects that we select will add up to, to that three megawatts. And project developers must find their own site. So they're, they're responsible for identifying the location of their project on the island. For both Molokai and Lanai, the commission's order approving CBRE phase two was to seek the entire allotment of CBRE phase two through competitive bidding. In other words, a request for proposals. There are many, many benefits to this. Competition should ensure that the lowest price projects possible are selected for the island. It will allow review of a developer's qualifications and the project characteristics to select the best possible project for the island and prevents many small projects from being spread across the islands to meet the total three megawatt need. On other islands, the company will have RFPs to select projects, but in addition, we'll have a process for projects smaller than 250 kilowatts, for example, small projects that may fit on a rooftop. These projects will be awarded to whoever applies first, as long as there is available capacity left in the program for that island and the project meets the requirements of the program. 
if the interest exceeds the available capacity, then there may be a situation where there is a competitive auction process. But for the most part, these projects will be selected on a first come, first served basis. The downside to this type of program is that because these projects will likely be selected on a first come, first served basis, they will not necessarily be the best possible project to meet the needs, but they will just meet the minimum requirements of the program and have applied first. We often see projects later drop out of these types of programs because developers haven't fully understood all of the requirements and what's needed to participate. The upside, however, of such a program is that it skips the RFP process, meaning that projects can be interconnected sooner and customers can start to enroll and participate in the community-based renewable energy program sooner than going through the entire RFP process. It also allows for an avenue for smaller projects. Smaller projects tend to not be easy to evaluate in an RFP process, and likely those projects don't have the knowledge or the funds to participate in an RFP process. So this will provide an avenue for, for projects smaller than 250 kilowatts to participate if they chose. As part of our meeting tonight, we'll be asking you to complete a survey. Colton Ching, who will speak after me, will cover this survey in more detail. However, I wanted to alert you to the fact that we have a question on the survey asking Molokai residents if they would prefer to keep CBRE Phase 2 on Molokai to an RFP, or if you'd like to carve out a portion of the program on Molokai to allow for this first come, first serve type program. This would mean that the company would run an RFP for the large portion of the CBRE Phase 2 megawatts that we're seeking, and then a small portion of kilowatts we would allow to be sought through this alternative process. So this next slide, walks through the steps to when we expect to be issuing the community-based renewable energy RFP for Molokai. Exactly a week ago today on July 9th, we filed our draft RFP with the PUC for their review um, and also for stakeholder review. And this RFP as well as the contract documents associated with that RFP are available on our website. Um, so the public can also go there to view the documents. On July 29th, we'll be meeting with the PUC for a technical conference to provide the PUC and anyone who wants to listen in more details into the documents that we file and the requirements for the programs. The PUC um, has provided information on their website on how you can um, participate and call into that technical conference. Then on August 12th, the commission has provided for parties and participants to file comments with the commission um, by August 12th. Once those comments are received, the company will review all of them. There's been an independent observer assigned for this RFP, and, and the, the goal of that independent observer is to ensure transparency, to make sure that we're taking into account comments and properly accounting for them in the documents. Um, and so we'll work with that independent observer to review the comments and decide what changes we may need to make to our draft documents. On September 8th, we'll file our second draft of the RFP with the commission for review and approval. The final two steps are not yet set and they're dependent on the PUC making further decisions. But um, if everything progresses along as um, currently indicated, we may be able to issue an RFP for the Molokai CBRE program before the end of this year. So I just wanted to wrap up today discussing a few ways in which the public can participate in the development of the CBRE phase two program and provide more input to the company in the program. First and foremost, we're meeting with you today to give you a first quick overview of the program. As I mentioned, we'll have the survey question that we laid out available for you, but we also welcome any other feedback that you may have on the program or the draft documents on our website um, and really any potential new renewable energy project on the island. Written comments can be submitted directly to the company or also to the PUC as part of the CBRE phase two docket. And as I mentioned, this feedback and comments, you know, we'll take that into account if received by that August 12th deadline when we're reviewing and, and making changes to our next draft of the RFP and contract documents. Once we select a project or projects, they'll be required to hold a public meeting. If we're still in the time of social distancing, unfortunately, that, you know, that meeting will be similar to this one um, in a virtual setting. But if um, by such time, uh, we can meet in person again, then the developer will be required to hold that public meeting on island. Um, and then after that public meeting, there's a, there's a required 30-day comment period where the developer must collect comments from the public over those 30 days and provide those to the company. In CBRE Phase 2, uh, unlike in our, our typical process where we would then file the PPA with the commission for approval, 
Um, if the projects we select are under two and a half megawatts, the commission has said that we do not have to go in and, and seek approval of those power purchase agreements or the contract with the developer. We can just enter into those and move forward. So that's great. It allows the projects to move faster to bring um, the benefits of the programs to the islands quicker. Uh, if they all are over two and a half megawatts, we will have to file with the commission for approval. And in which case, community members can at any time during that PUC approval process submit public comments to the commission on the project. And then finally, all projects, depending on their location and their size, will, will likely require some type of permitting before they can be, be built. And the, this permitting approval process, depending on the permits, usually has public comment periods or even public hearings um, that may be a part of those permit processes. And that's another place where the community can participate. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you this evening. Like as I said, I'm really happy that I was able to, to come back this year and talk to you. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions after tonight's presentation. I'll now turn it over to Colton Ching, our Senior Vice President of Planning and Technology. Thank you, Becca. Uh, good evening, everyone. I want to talk about long-range planning for the utility, the things we need to do at Hawaiian Electric to ensure that power will remain reliable, be more resilient, and be cleaner way into the future beyond some of the things that uh, Rebecca talked about just now. Uh, there are uh, really three fundamental reasons why we need to plan for the future. Uh, one is to be more independent and reduce our dependency uh, on fossil fuels. Uh, the second is to really have, have an impact on mitigating the impacts of climate change to our islands, uh, but also at the same time uh, to do things to enhance and increase the resilience of our system uh, and adapt to the impacts of climate change that we know will happen regardless of our efforts. Uh, and thirdly, we want to modernize our electric grid, right? The, the system that produces, transmits, and distributes electricity um, to and amongst customers uh, to make that work well, to make that run efficiently and reliably, uh, and to do so in a way that gives our customers uh, more options and more choices in how they produce and consume uh, energy on the system. But getting to that clean, independent, resilient uh, electric system of a future that we're striving for uh, involves more than Hawaiian Electric. Uh, and all of us as residents of, of Hawaii, we play a role in achieving these goals. This slide here shows five of probably of the most important ways we can all help to get there. And that includes reducing the amount of energy that we use both at home and at work, uh, using smart uh, appliances that are not just more efficient, but can participate in some of the time-based pricing programs and response uh, uh, and grid services that we're going to need into the future. Uh, upgrading to advanced meter. An advanced meter allows our customers to see their electricity consumption at any point in time and how it changes uh, from minute to minute uh, versus a traditional meter where you basically get a reading uh, once a month. Uh, as Matt talked about, it also includes uh, buying an electric vehicle, uh, whether it's for your home or for your business. Uh, electric vehicles not just provide uh, a source of flexible load for our electric system, but it leverages all of our combined efforts to reduce our fossil fuel use and increase the use of renewable energy for the electric system and really leverages it uh, to reduce our consumption of fossil fuels on our transportation sector, which today is by far the largest uh, consumer of fossil fuels uh, when you look at all the different sectors here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and last but not least, right, for our customers uh, participating in the various uh, energy options that we offer, and in the future we plan to offer even more of them, um, by making good and careful decisions, informed decisions about what uh, option works best for you, um, that'll also help us get to our 100% renewable energy goal. So what is integrated planning, right? What does that term really mean? Um, first and foremost, it's, it's, it's nothing more than our term for our uh, long range planning effort for Hawaiian Electric. And like as I mentioned earlier, we need to plan for the long term 
because utility infrastructure uh, can often take uh, many, many years to, to, to be developed. Uh, when a decision is made to do something, again, it can take five or even more years uh, for a power plant, uh, a distribution line, a substation, uh, a customer program uh, to be developed. And one thing about electricity is even though it may take many years for these resources and programs to materialize, um, when a customer um, builds a new home, when an existing customer flip, flips on a light, uh, they want the power to be there. So we need to anticipate what's happening in the future uh, and plan for it both for the short term and the long term. And integrated grid planning is our specific effort to plan for that long term period. Uh, like any long term planning process, uh, like this diagram here shows, it starts off with data collection, getting right inputs and assumptions, uh, not just of today, but into the future of what the electric system needs to do. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, a, in an upcoming slide. And here at Hawaiian Electric, we've been spending about a year and a half uh, working with various stakeholders to help develop the right assumptions, the right set of data to actually begin our planning analysis, which is step two. And we're sort of at the cusps of wrapping up our data collection work right now uh, and on, on, on the eve of starting our step two called defining a plan, where we will fundamentally identify uh, the system grid needs, the needs of all of our electric systems, including that of Molokai. Uh, to figure out what we need to do for that grid uh, going into the future. Step three, uh, which is a little bit different from uh, most long-term planning processes, actually includes a procurement step. So as Rebecca talked earlier about the Molokai RFP uh, and the, the procurements for CBR, CBRE, uh, step three involves uh, going through competitive processes like Becca described to procure the next set of resources, the next set of short-term resources that we need um, for, the, for all of our islands, including Molokai. Uh, and that resources we're gonna need after 2025 that we feel that are going to be needed in the 2025, maybe the 2030 timeframe uh, after those resources uh, that Becca just spoke to and we'll actually go through a procurement process to actually identify what the market can deliver as options. Uh, and that's a little bit different from how we've done things in the past, but we feel that this will uh, deliver a couple of benefits to our customers. Number one, it allows for a faster process that allows those next set of resources to come online and produce uh, value to our customers sooner. Uh, than a process in which procurement happens separately. Uh, and it also allows us to create greater certainty uh, on the things that are going to be changing on our island grids in the next five to 10 years. So that in step four in the process, we can further optimize our plans for the, the 10, 15 and 20 year period, knowing what resources we are selecting for the near term. And so it actually improves, we feel it will improve the quality and e efficiency and effectiveness uh, of our long range plans. Uh, and lastly, in step five, we take those long range plans combined with the resources that we have selected in our procurement processes in step three, we deliver them to the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, our regulators, as a complete package so they can see both our plans and our resources uh, and the evaluation of those resources where we identify those we're selecting as a package and can hopefully make a more complete uh, decision on approval of both of the resources we select and of the plans we deliver. Okay, so how does that long range planning benefit customers in Molokai? Uh, number one, it helps us identify things we need to do to our system and programs we need to create to deliver more options uh, for our customers, right? Options uh, for all of you to make decisions on that can help you lower your electric bill. 
Uh, next, it also creates uh, the right kinds of financial incentives for charging an electric vehicle. And this doesn't just benefit those of us who may elect to, to buy or, or, or use an electric vehicle. It also creates the right financial incentives so that other utility customers, other customers on Molokai, even those who don't have EVs, to also benefit from the fact that more customers are using electric vehicles and there's a greater amount of electricity um, being consumed on the island that helps to spread costs out. Uh, next, it helps with our efforts to integrate higher levels of renewable energy to figure out what we need to do to modernize our grid to do that uh, and ultimately achieve our very, very ambitious state uh, renewable portfolio standard goal that Rebecca covered earlier. Uh, it also helps us uh, by identifying uh, uh, efficiencies that we can have on a grid and that includes the more efficient integration of renewables on the system we need to do more than simply bolt on and attach renewables to a grid we want them to be highly utilized we want them to be efficient in their operation and integrating technologies uh, like battery storage and other technologies can really help increase the usefulness increase the uh, effectiveness as well as the efficiency of the renewables that we're looking to add. On the right-hand side, we're also looking at uh, time of use rates, which is a concept of where electricity rates are not the same throughout the entire day, but may vary at different times of the day to match the actual cost uh, that we have to actually produce electricity. And that can not just save our customers money if they can adjust their consumption of energy around the lower cost times to use energy, but because they're using more energy during the lower cost times and using less energy during the higher cost times, uh, it actually reduces the utilities cost to, to produce and deliver electricity to all of our customers. And so everyone benefits uh, from smart use of electricity based on time. Uh, a lot of our customers have already adopted solar, um, but many more want to. Um, and we are offering programs like, like CBRE that Becca covered. We want to make sure that we can offer more CBRE programs in the future uh, and potentially different types of, of programs that allow uh, the benefits of solar and other forms of renewable energy um, to customers without the physical installation uh, of a renewable resource on someone's property. And then last but not least, uh, the electricity, this transformation of our electric system really won't be of much value if it's not reliable uh, and resilient. And so part of our work to plan for the future uh, is to increase and enhance the reliability of the grid, take advantage of new technologies that allow us to detect a power outage before a customer calls us, um, to make that response occur even before we get that, that call, and in many cases to remotely be able to heal or fix the outage uh, without having to have a physical person there uh, to make that work happen. And that all results in, in better, better power quality, um, higher reliability and resilience for our customers. Uh, when we plan for the future, especially for the long term, it isn't enough to plan for, the, for our electric system based upon what we're seeing today. So as I sort of alluded to in the slide where I laid out the integrated grid planning process, we need to really factor consider, and consider things that are gonna be changing in the future. The, the changes in consumer uh, needs, the consumption of energy, uh, how many uh, customers will have, not just today, but five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now. The cost of different resources, the kinds of new businesses, that may be created and developed on each of the islands that we serve. Um, the new energy technologies, whether it's energy storage or a renewable generation technology, those things will change as well. And we wanna take advantage and incorporate new technologies in there. Our customer choices, right? How many customers are choosing to adopt roof rooftop solar? We wanna make sure that our plans can accommodate not just the current amount of customers who have rooftop solar, but what we, what we anticipate to be the future uh, requests and desires by our customers to add additional solar. Uh, we wanna factor in the changing costs and the changing designs for large systems, whether it's a generator 
uh, whether it's a transmission system, whether it's a substation. Uh, and like I mentioned before, how the adoption of electric vehicles will change over time, because that may represent an incredibly large uh, impact on the amount of energy and the amount of customers that we need to serve. And then last but not least, one of the new things we need to take into account in the future is that we cannot make the assumption that the weather will remain constant. I think we've all are starting to see how our weather and our weather patterns are changing. And so we need to ensure that in our long range plans, we take into account how the weather will change, how the winds will change, how frequent will storms come, you know, what's going to happen with flooding and sea level rise and factor all of that in. One uh, additional facet in our integrated grid planning process that's a bit different from how we've done it in the past is that we have uh, customer uh, and stakeholder participation throughout the long range planning process. And we don't do it just through one venue or with one group of folks. Uh, we actually have uh, a ser several sets, uh, four categories of, of public and stakeholder participation. Uh, the first are working groups, which is a more deeper dive into very specific topics like uh, helping the utility identify um, the, the kinds of loads that will be coming in the next several years, how the economy on each of our islands are changing that will affect the amount of electricity that will be consumed over the long term. That's one really uh, good example of how a working group has been formed to look at these specific topics and provide uh, input provide guidance uh, and really help the utility uh, staff co-develop some of these key inputs into the pl planning process. The second group is, is a stakeholder council. Stakeholders council is a little bit different is because we're looking for stakeholders here to provide a broader, more strategic view uh, and oversight over the work that we're doing in this process. Uh, and so for the island of, of Molokai, uh, as a community representative, we have Audrey Newman as a, a new uh, stakeholder council member rep representing the Molokai community. And I think Audrey uh, is joining us uh, via WebEx. Uh, so hi, Audrey, thank you. Thank you for being a part of the stakeholder council. Uh, and again, different from working groups, the stakeholder council provides a broader, more holistic view, providing inputs, asking good questions to us throughout the process. Uh, the third group uh, is the general public. Uh, events like tonight, uh, which, you know, like we would have loved to have held in person in Molokai, but are forced to do it remotely. Uh, events like tonight uh, are, are also part of the process. So not just this evening, but throughout the uh, long-term planning process, we plan to not just share information with anyone who is interested in listening, uh, but also providing, uh, al allowing an opportunity for folks to provide comments or input or suggestions to us. Uh, and because we won't be able, to, we aren't able to do this event uh, in person, I'll speak to a virtual open house uh, in the next slide uh, in, as, and share some ways in which uh, hopefully all of you can take some time and provide us uh, some comments to our IGP process. And then last on the far right is the technical advisory, advisory panel. And the technical advisory panel that we call the TAP uh, are a group of uh, industry experts. They're members from other electric utilities, from academia, uh, from folks who you know, have technical backgrounds, operating electric systems, uh, doing analysis as a profession to provide an independent look and evaluation of the technical work that our utility engineers do in this process. Uh, and it allows the working groups, the stakeholder councils, and you as a member of the, as a member of the public um, to um, see the work that we do, not just by trying to understand directly what we do, uh, but having the technical advisory panel weigh in uh, and pri provide their, their thoughts and insight um, on the completeness, the effectiveness of the technical work that we do. And they're actually going to be assisting us as well, providing sort of another set of eyes in the work that we do. Uh, and because we have some really good experts from literally around the globe helping us uh, with this work, they're also a good source of very strong technical knowledge uh, to us as well in the work that we do. So 
uh, again, because we weren't able to hold this this event in person, uh, we've created a website where we have what we call a virtual open house. A lot of the material that uh, I shared uh, earlier, um, the surveys that uh, that Becca mentioned, um, various forms for or venues for folks to provide us comments, to ask us a question, or to just learn more about what we're doing in our company and what we're doing with our long range planning process. They're all available on our open house. So if we can ask Shana to take a moment uh, to go to the uh, open house page, we can just do a very quick preview of what's in there. Um, if you want to take a look at that um, virtual open house, please do so. Uh, the slide had the link at communitymeetingshawaii.com, so it's easy to get to. And Shana now has a live uh, uh, image, uh, actually a live page showing. So, uh, Shana, if yeah, if you can scroll to the different tabs in the right, covers the different types of categories, a lot deeper set of information from what I covered tonight. Um, but but much of the same categories that we covered, both myself and Rebecca. Um, Shana, maybe if you can go to the welcome slide. So this is the landing page. So when you go to communitymeetingshawaii.com, uh, this is the page that you'll first see. You can see here on the right-hand side, this is the survey that Rebecca talked about. So this is a survey that we've developed. Uh, we use a similar version for our meetings on on the other islands, uh, but this is where you can uh, answer some information in the survey um, that helps not just uh, what we're doing in integrated grid planning, uh, but as Becca, uh, Becca mentioned, uh, has some information, uh, has a section in there where if you click that, click that you currently live or work on Molokai, then there's a set of questions about CBRE that uh, Rebecca mentioned, and you can fill that information there. Um, so I asked if you have some time, please go uh, to this website, you know, kind of browse around, kick the tires, look at the different sections. If you do have the time, please uh, fill out uh, the survey. If you have any questions, you have any suggestions on our work and how we should be doing our planning into the future, uh, please, uh, you know, click the comment section uh, or, you know, fill out the survey to, to provide your thoughts. Um, in addition to use of that that web page, yeah, thank you, Shana. Uh, you can also email us directly uh, at igp at hawaiielectric.com. And if you really, really want to learn a lot more about the integrated grid planning process, we have a web page with a ton of information, a lot of links, a lot of PowerPoint presentations uh, at the hawaiielectric.com forward slash igp website, where you can lose yourself for hours. Uh, learning about uh, integrated grid planning. So that's it for me. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your time. Uh, I am going to pass the screen back to uh, Sharon uh, to continue on with uh, tonight's discussion. Okay, thank you, Colton. So yes, thank you for your attention. Um, this is the end of our formal presentation. And before we go into our question and answer session, just wanted to share a quick reminder that we want you to be prepared. As Colton mentioned, we need to be prepared for extreme events and hurricane season in Hawaii started in June and runs until November. So Hawaiian Electric provides this handbook to give you tips on how you can prepare you and your families. Um, it's available at our website um, located here, hawaiianelectric.com prepare. And hard copies are also available at these locations in your Molokai community. So thank you again. At this time, I'll turn the program to Mahina, who will help moderate our question and answer session. Great, thank you, Sharon. At this time, uh, I want to remind everyone that you can submit questions either on WebEx, going to the bottom of your screen and click on the options box and look for that a note that says Q&A. If you're joining us on Facebook, simply put it into the comment box. And our email address for questions for tonight is communityrelations.mauicounty at hawaiianelectric.com, or you can see that on the screen. I'd like to invite all of our uh, presenters to come back on screen. We have a 
number of questions. Um, and for folks writing questions, it's helpful if you make reference, if there's something specific you want. We've covered everything from infrastructure upgrades on Molokai to integrated grid planning, renewable energy projects, um, electric vehicle charging stations. So sometimes we're not really clear uh, what your question is. So I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, with reading off some of these questions. They're very interesting and thank you all who are submitting. I think this one is really important. Uh, first off, let me say those of you are asking about a recorded uh, viewing of tonight's presentations, they will be on Hawaiian Electric's YouTube channel. So you can uh, view it there or send us an email at the community relations Maui County at hawaiianelectric.com and we'll send you a link uh, in the future. And if some of the information, you know, can be a little bit too technical, a lot of things we try to insert tonight, uh, may be a little difficult to absorb. I think the video might also help and um, we can go from there if you have additional questions too. Uh, there was a question online. Um, someone used the phrase flexible load. Uh, if someone could please expound on that and explain that further, Colton. Yeah, thank thank you, Mahina. That was that was me that used jargon. I apologize for that. Uh, so the concept of flexible load is where a customer can either um, adjust their their use of electricity or re in other cases leverage a distributed energy resource like a rooftop solar system and battery system that they may have uh, at their home or in their business uh, and get into an arrangement uh, directly with the utility or through a third party called an aggregator to allow for that loads to change uh, to increase loads at times to decrease loads to export power back to the grid um, that helps us at Hawaiian Electric run the grid, right? And we'll compensate you for providing that sort of flexibility, um, that ability to make those kinds of adjustments because it allows us uh, to avoid having to make an investment uh, in some other resource to provide that same functionality. So it's the concept of really leveraging a customer's load or the resources that they've already have invested in or may be investing in that benefits not just them, uh, but also benefits other customers uh, on our islands. Hope that helped with the answer. Great, thank you, Colton. Coming in from Facebook, time of use is already being used, isn't it? Uh, could someone, one of our panelists, please respond to whether or not time of use rates are already in use? Yeah, Mahina, I'll take that one as well, although I'm not thank a you, time Colton. of use expert. Uh, yes, so the the, the question, the, the person who asked the question is correct. We do have some time of use rates in place today. Um, we have uh, time of use rates for electric vehicles. We have a few uh, time of use rates pilots already in place, um, but they're relatively small uh, and there are limits on how many people can participate in them. Uh, and so we envision in, in that future uh, when customers have the ability to more um, explicitly control the consumption of energy, especially with customers who make investments in things like solar and storage at their home, uh, we want to uh, offer a broader set of time of use rates that, that will work for them that may be a little bit different um, from the design of time of use rates today. Uh, but it's a great question because uh, the person, you know, he really, really understands that we do have time of use rate pilots in effect today. Great, thank you. A question to WebEx and uh, Colton, if you could hang on to that virtual mic <laughs> as well. Um, it starts off by saying culturally, Native Hawaiians believe we have a responsibility to Aina and a personal spiritual reciprocal relationship to our environment, the sun, the ocean, the wind. Thus, Native Hawaiians need to be part of any discussions for renewable energy. So a question with the IG process, where are Native Hawaiians represented? Okay, great question. Uh, thank you for that one. Uh, so uh, we do not have an explicit um, stakeholder uh, representation for uh, any, any Native Hawaiian organization, uh, but we do have stakeholder council members who are uh, of Native Hawaiian background. Um, it's not the same thing. Uh, and we'll take this uh, 
question or this comment uh, as input to look at what we should be doing in our engagement and discussions going forward. Uh, but we do have folks like Pono Shim, who actually was a panelist for the Oahu um, IGP meeting and is a member of the Stakeholder Council. He's been pretty active in the process. And for those of you who do know Pono Shim, um, you know, he's, he's extremely uh, passionate uh, on on his heritage. Thank you, Colton. And I will say from a public affairs end that in all projects, we certainly make an effort to reach out to Native Hawaiian organization, Native Hawaiian leaders, and solicit um, advice, perspectives, input, guidance uh, when necessary. Uh, we're very active on that front. I can't say it's always perfect, um, but definitely every concerted effort is made on all of the five islands that we serve. Uh, this question is for Matt. If inter-island travel restrictions are put in place again, or the state reverts back to stay-at-home orders, will that stop the work that you spoke about from happening, or uh, is it deemed critical or essential, Matt? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it it kind of depends on the situation at the time. You know, obviously, if customers are out of power, depending on the situation, that's usually deemed the most critical. But a lot of things, the things I spoke about tonight, you know, the Kaluakoi upgrades of, uh, you know, uh, replacing underground lines and the Hendrix cable likely would be uh, uh, considered essential, you know, provided customers under power elsewhere. Yeah, and Mahina, this is Colton, if I can just jump on to what Matt said. Uh, even before the 14-day quarantine requirement for inner island travel was lifted prior, you know, when it was still in place, uh, our uh, field workers, including our linemen and electricians uh, that would be doing this kind of work were deemed essential. Uh, and we did have the ability, you know, under certain restrictions, right, in terms of documentation and whatnot, uh, to, to fly inner island without the quarantine requirement. Thank you, Colton. Uh, Matt, going back to you, because you spoke about this a little early on, uh, perhaps a viewer missed it. Um, there's a few comments about uh, concerns about paying for their utility bills while under COVID conditions, you know, income has been really restricted and limited. Uh, could you repeat again a little bit about what our plans are in assistance for our customers? And Sharon, also, if you have anything to add. Sure. Uh, you know, we have suspended our disconnections through uh, September, and we're encouraging everyone to use this time between now and then to contact us if you're having a hard time or will have a hard time uh, paying your bill when September comes around. Currently, there are a variety of uh, payment options through Hawaiian Electric, as well as assistance that's available through public and private means. Uh, the website to go to to access some of these things is www.hawaiianelectric.com forward slash COVID-19. Great. Thank you, Matt. A question for Becca. Um, Becca, in community-based renewable energy, will microgrids be part of that? And I think Colton might be able to add to that as well. Sure. So we're not seeking uh, microgrids at, at this current time in CBRE. We're just looking for um, standalone solar projects, um, but it doesn't prevent those projects from being used later if, if we were to look at microgrids on the island. Um, but for right now, the we're still kind of getting our feet wet and learning about CBRE ourselves, and we want to make sure the program's successful. We're, we're starting with just um, PV plus storage projects. Thank you, Becca. On microgrids, Colton, did you want to also add? Yeah, maybe just to, if I could expand the question a little bit to beyond just uh, CBRE. Uh, so, you know, we're always uh, looking at different ways to enhance the resilience uh, of our system. Uh, and microgrids is one really good example, one good way to create additional resilience because you could uh, have a generator, uh, perhaps with some storage uh, located, you know, perhaps in a more remote location. And if so, if that transmission or distribution line to those locations uh, gets damaged by a storm, for example, uh, then that generator is able to serve that neighborhood without the 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 normal source of power. Um, that's one you know useful way to enhance resilience. But like any great uh, option, it's not always the best option, right? So we look at microgrids. We look at things like enhancing the the strength of of the 
of the poles for that line. Uh, we look at things about like creating diversity in the sources of lines that feed a, into a community, uh, and even some of the basic stuff like you know doing enhanced uh, trimming of vegetation. Uh, so the likelihood of that circuit going down uh, in high winds is reduced. So all of that is what we look at. And in our evaluation, if we make the, the determination uh, that a microgrid is a great solution, it definitely is on the table. Great. Thank you, Colton. Uh, there were a couple of questions on microgrids, so you knocked both of them off um, of the park. A question for Matt. Matt, uh, could you tell us a little bit about why there was a delay with uh, the upgrades to Kaloa Koi? Sure. First of all, apologize for the delay in that. Uh, you know, it was due to a variety of things. We we relooked at our design, what we had planned to do uh, out there to address some of the issues. And like I said, a bunch of factors, COVID included. But again, sorry for the delay. Uh, we anticipate starting that work actually next week. Thank you, Matt. Uh, this next will be a question for Colton, uh, coming from our Facebook audience. Puerto Rico and Cuba are great islands to study how they have created or are creating more resilient communities in regards to food and energy security. Is this something we're learning lessons from, from those areas and what type of research work or lessons learned from hard hit areas have we engaged in? Yeah, so great question. You know, whenever there's an event like that, it always is a great opportunity to learn, right? Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, it's an even greater opportunity because like our islands here in Hawaii, they also have an island system. Uh, and when Hurricane uh, Maria uh, cut diagonally through the island, uh, it resulted in some pretty significant uh, um, damage to their electric system. So, you know, several things we learned from that, you know, all the way from things like how we better plan and prepare uh, how we practice our emergency response, what kind of stores and equipment and materials we keep uh, on hand on each of our islands, how we work with federal and state agencies so that we can have good access to replacement supplies uh, and crews to help with restoration, uh, and then in how we design and operate our grid itself um, so that when a storm comes, uh, the system will not be damaged or will get damaged less, and that we have uh, less of a job to restore and repair uh, after a storm passes. Those are just some of the examples of the things we've learned in, in what happened with Puerto Rico. We actually had uh, folks from the utility uh, as well as from their, um, their regulators come and visit us in Hawaii to actually learn from, from us um, some of the things we're doing in distributed generation um, but it also gave us an opportunity to learn directly from them some of the things they've experienced uh, and some of the new things they're trying to do. Uh, I can't say that I've uh, had the opportunity to visit Cuba, um, but uh, it's a great question. Um, so far, no trip yet, no exchange yet. Thank you, Colton. Rebecca, uh, about community-based renewable energy, would we consider talking with a group of Molokai community about this? Um, obviously, by a virtual meeting, it's a little difficult to have people part of a more uh, discussion and dialogue, even sometimes how we come to Molokai and we kind of stick around later and talk story. Um, so would we be open to that? And um, I think the best way probably for folks interested is to email a request to communityrelations.mauicountyathawaiianelectric.com the address on there, but Becca, could you speak a little bit about talking more about CBRE to uh, folks out there? Sure, yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to follow up and provide further information, more detailed um, information. It's hard to fit it all into a, you know, 10 to 15 minutes um, slot here tonight. So definitely willing to, um, because we are gonna do things through an RFP, there are some things that, um, you know, if, if, if a group was interested in, in submitting a proposal that we would be somewhat limited in, in those conversations because we have to make sure anybody that's interested in submitting a proposal is, is given those same opportunities, but definitely can speak to the community more, give more um, input. And as I mentioned, um, the PC technical conference can also be listened into um, on July 29th. We have, I think, about three um, or two, maybe two hours there that we're um, be speaking on the program. So we'll go a lot more in depth of 
um, the details and the requirements of the program during that presentation. Thank you, Becca, very much. Uh, this looks like a question for Colton. Colton, can you tell us why we can't just do solar PV and batteries in order to reach 100% renewable energy? Uh, we get that question a lot, and, and it really comes down to risk and diversity. Um, solar uh, energy and battery storage are great technologies. Uh, and, you know, as Rebecca um, mentioned in her, in her slides, you know, we're doing a lot of it. We're doing a lot of it on, on Oahu. Uh, we have a lot of it uh, already in service and we plan to add um, it, an enormous amount more. But like anything, you know, relying on any one technology or one source of, of power can be at risk, right? Can be a risky thing. Uh, so if we were to only rely on solar, uh, we would need to figure out a way how to still to continue to serve all of our customers reliably during periods where um, the solar production isn't very high. Right. I think we can all think about times over the last several years where it kind of felt like Seattle at home, right? Where we had a week, two weeks of rain or at least cloudy weather uh, and very little direct sunlight. And it's those periods where solar production will be low. Uh, so as we figure out what our needs in the future uh, need to be, we need to plan for um, producing and delivering uh, enough energy to all of our customers in a reliable way during normal weather events, uh, as well as during, you know, less common, maybe more abnormal ones, like when we have two to three weeks or even more. You guys remember the 40 days of, of rain that we had, I think, back in 2007. Um, if we only had solar, you know, we would have to put in so much solar <clears throat> and so much storage to produce enough energy for those kinds of periods that it would probably be, be more expensive than, than any of us could afford. Great, thank you, Colton. Uh, looks like from Matt. Matt, with the rise in COVID cases uh, on the islands in Hawaii, will Hawaiian Electric Crews be coming from Oahu or Maui to do the upcoming work? And what kind of safety precautions um, is Hawaiian Electric taking to ensure that our crews are healthy and will keep the public safe uh, from any exposure. Sure. Uh, I mean, whenever we have large jobs, we usually bring in crews from uh, Maui or even Oahu. And, uh, you know, we follow all the state and CDC guidance, social distancing, good hygiene, wearing masks when we can't social distance. We avoid large gatherings. And the company has also set up additional screens for uh, employees or even employees' family members who might have traveled outside the state. We are doing all we can to make sure that uh, we don't help the spread of COVID-19. Great, thank, thank you, Matt. Uh, this is a question for Rebecca, and I'm interpreting it to be for community-based renewable energy. It says that we have a church on Molokai with several facilities. Um, how can they apply for solar assistance? And I'm um, going to interpret that to be, can they participate uh, in the community-based renewable energy program? Uh, with their church and their facilities? Yes, um, so if uh, the church has you know, enough um, facilities, either rooftops or, or land to meet the size requirements. So as I mentioned right now, it's currently set at um, the small size being 250 kilowatts, which is quite large actually. Um, but you know, we, we do have the question about whether there's interest for allowance of smaller projects on the island. Um, but if, if a project needs to, or if a, site meets the requirements, um, then currently with just the RFP process, they would have to, you know, likely partner with a developer who would be helping them to build the, the solar facilities and um, and battery and bid into, um, into the RFP to participate. Great, thank you. Uh, this question, um, I'm not really sure, but perhaps one of you could clarify um, how state and federal credits get put in and who makes those determinations. It came from a Facebook viewer and it says that uh, this person was sad to learn that the 30% state credit on solar installation has a $2,250 cap. So the most that's the most that they could get after investing uh, $25,000 on the solar installation. 
so uh, this individual has learned that that was for 2019 and believes that it went down for 2020, which stayed in federal credits, um, still being important. Is there more credits in the horizon and, and how do these credits get set? Um, the viewer feels that if we want people to change to solar and other renewable energy, these tax credits can certainly assist. I can take a stab at this one, Mahina, and if others have further thoughts, they can um, chime in. So there's two separate tax credits. There's a tax credit on the federal side. Um, and that tax credit did start declining in 2020 from 30%. Um, I think it, it went down to 25% and then it'll go down to 20%. Um, and then eventually in 2023, it will go down to 10%. My understanding is that you can grandfather the tax credit um, to levels, you know, higher levels through 2022, as long as your project is built in 2023. Um, and that applies on both the residential and the utility um, scale size projects. So those federal tax credits can be applied to either project. On the state side, there are state tax credits for solar projects um, and wind projects in the state of Hawaii. And um, there are different tax credits based on whether or not the project is a residential um, project or a, a utility scale project. And actually in the most recent legislative session um, that just ended, the legislature did keep the residential state tax credit. There is a cap on it per um, solar installation, depending on how, how the installation is done. There, there is a cap that would apply. Um, they, the state, however, has recently just um, done away with the, so they, they've sunsetted as of December 31st, 2019, the utility scale tax credit. But moving forward, there is still the option for the residential um, tax credit, and, and we do agree that those tax credits play a role in both, both residential and utility scale projects, and not only encouraging adoption of them, but ensuring lower costs for our customers. Thank you, Becca. Uh, this question is about time of use. It was uh, related to the earlier question of time of use. Um, the Bureau wants to clarify that regarding the time of use question previously asked, um, I'm referring to my electric bill does it, doesn't it show a different rate depending on the time of day? Um, Colton, are you uh, familiar enough with time of use to respond? Yeah, so, um, and, and we can always follow up online with, with the requester, uh, but if a customer is currently not participating, you know, didn't make the elective choice to be part of any current uh, time of use pilot, then their electricity uh, for their home is is charged at, at one rate, right? For every kilowatt hour, regardless if it's being uh, consumed at, in the, at, at noon or at midnight, it's the same per kilowatt hour rate. Uh, but the person asking the question may be someone who's participating in, in one of our tariff programs, one of our time of use pilots. Uh, and if that's the case, they, they do have uh, uh, electric rates that differ at different points in the day. Um, the programs are relatively relatively small. They have different tiers at different pricing. Uh, going forward into the future, especially as we add more renewables onto our system and consumers, our customers begin adopting more of these distributed technologies, then we are looking to create a greater amount of time of use rates. Uh, with more part customers participating in them, and the rates and the times that the rates differ may be different uh, from the programs. And today, in fact, they're probably very likely to be different um, from some of the programs we have today. Thank you, Colton. Uh, a question for Rebecca: Does Molokai still need a four to five megawatt of energy project? What are we using now, and will you be looking for the four to five megawatt through community-based renewable energy? and other projects? Sure, so um, the m and &E project, which we recently terminated, um, was about a four and a half megawatt project, but that actually was capped at the amount of energy they could send to the system at any given time at um, 2.6 megawatts, and it had a three megawatt best. Um, in our current RFP that's ongoing, we're looking for about a three megawatt size um, solar facility um, paired with storage. And then in CBRE, we'll also be looking for another three megawatts total um, paired with storage. So um, we are looking to, you know, significantly increase the amount of energy um, on the island of Molokai that's, that's from these renewable 
resources. Um, we'll be reevaluating now that we've terminated the MNEP project um, as those legal pre proceedings progress, how we may want to re you know, replace um, that energy or, or what the need will be. Um, and in addition to these renewable resources, we'll also be looking to see what other types of um, investments into the grid may, may, need, uh, may be needed in order to support all of this renewable energy um, coming on. But the goal would be to really reduce the island's re, um, reliance on fossil fuels and, and rely more on renewable energy. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, this could be a question for any of you. Um, have you considered incentives for communities and individual property owners to use less power? In other words, what type of efforts have we made to encourage conserva conservation? Uh, and are there any um, partnerships that we've engaged with to encourage such um, programs? Yes, I'll take that one. So we work very closely with Hawaii Energy, who offers rebates for the installation of energy efficient appliances or products, so um, LED lighting, efficient air conditioning. I think they did a refrigerator a change out program um, in the past um, specifically for Molokai. So uh, those are the types of um, efficiency programs and rebates that they have offered in the past. So we usually try to um, work with them and partner if there are opportunities to work with certain groups or groups of customers on your island. Thank you, Sharon. There's a question here about access to other virtual meetings that have been held on different islands. Uh, I believe the virtual meetings are the current developer meetings um, to vet out. You know, we're one of uh, a few private companies that really, really encourage anyone who bids into our request for proposals to be engaged with the community. In fact, we require it now. Becca, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, how do people get to the developer websites? Are they listed anywhere that they could view previous meetings? Sure, so um, for the developer programs, um, we don't have any current, I think, community meetings up for the island of Molokai, but once we select projects, we do have a renewable energy status board um, on our Hawaiian Electric website, and we link to developer websites there, and those developers, um, for projects usually include the, the links to their community meetings and video recordings of those community meetings. That's a new process that we've recently instituted to help our customers find more information on our pro, you know, on our ongoing projects. So um, as projects are selected for the island of Molokai, they'll be added to that renewable energy status board on our website. Um, I do believe we also um, have other community meetings that the utilities held are up um, on our on our YouTube page and other Hawaiian Electric pages. And I think if you're following on Facebook, um, one of our social media um, team members has posted a link to um, where those other community meetings can be found. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Thank you to our team behind the scenes. Uh, here's a question, Colton, uh, looks to be for you. What is Hawaiian Electric doing to improve our reliability? There, we're doing a lot of things to improve reliability. Uh, one thing that we're doing on all of our islands, and, and Matt alluded to it uh, in his slides, is uh, we're taking a look at uh, all of our um, devices in the field, right? All of our poles, all of our um, transformers, all of our conductors and our cables, and you know, assessing the condition of them and taking steps to really ramp up our efforts to replace them uh, proactively uh, before they actually fail, uh, whether it's a pole or cable or what have you. Um, you know, we we don't always get an opportunity to replace it before we experience a failure, uh, but our efforts uh, to do that, that's called asset management, um, are starting to incorporate more sophisticated uh, data analysis of of, of inspection data and test data that we have so that we can more smartly replace replace those assets. Uh, it's something that got started uh, on, on Oahu first, but now it's something that we're doing on, on all of our islands. The cable replacement uh, that Matt spoke to, the poles that, uh, that, he, that he spoke to being replaced last year, uh, all of those things work towards replacing assets so that they're in a better condition uh, and ultimately operate uh, more reliably. 
the other thing that we are doing, and we still have more work to do here, is to really um, look to uh, do trimming of vegetation. We call it vegetation management. Those trees and bushes and vines that get close to our poles and wires, uh, they are typically a cause for a third or more of the outages that our customers experience. And so we're looking at different ways to approach and analyze and determine where best to do our trimming and also to improve the ways in which we do our trimming where when we do go to an area to cut back vegetation, uh, those trims are more effective and you know the, the bush or the branch or the tree will not grow back into the lines uh, as quickly or in the ways that it had in the past. So those are some just some examples. Great, thank you, Colton. And if you could hold on to that uh, virtual mic. We're coming to the close of our meeting. We did plan for our meeting to end at seven and we really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, this is a final question to Colton and I'm gonna turn it over to Sharon uh, and then we'll close for the evening. If we weren't able to get to your question, we'll do our best to reach you directly. Um, Colton, this question is, how can someone from Molokai uh, provide comments to Hawaiian Electric as we move forward in planning for the future? There are several ways, and I'm so thankful that someone is asking the question because uh, I, I hope there's some interest and desire to, to provide comments behind that question. Uh, there's several ways, right? One is uh, you can just email us directly uh, at igp at hawaiianelectric.com. It's an easy email, hopefully, to, to remember and just send an email. Um, and myself and several of our folks will look at it and get you either a response to your question or an intake of a comment and suggestion you have. Uh, we're gonna take the comments that were made tonight also as an input. Uh, as I covered in an earlier slide, you can go to our virtual open house, provide comments either through the survey or the comment section uh, on the, uh, the website directly. And so before I forget, um, the address uh, for that is, is hopefully easy to remember. It's Community Meetings Hawaii, all one word, communitymeetingshawaii.com. And if you go there, you'll see several ways to provide us comments. Terrific. I, um... Can you imagine Moloka'i not wanting to weigh in? So Moloka'i folks, you know, we are always open to uh, input and dialogue conversations and guidance, um, your perspective as all our islands are important. So before I hand off to Sharon, you know, I do want to say um, this is so new for us. This is our actual first virtual community meeting. We'll be uh, meeting with the folks on Lanai next week, um, but Moloka'i, you know, we come to you regularly. We've been very uh, fortunate to have uh, joining us tonight, Sharon Suzuki, president of our utilities on Maui, Moloka'i, Lanai, and Hawaii Island. You've heard from Colton Ching, our senior vice president of planning and technology for Hawaiian Electric, and head of renewable acquisitions is our director for that department, Rebecca Dehoff Masushima, and Matt McNeff from Maui, who oversees uh, utilities along with Sharon for Maui, Moloka'i, Lanai. So I'm Mahina Martin. I've been your moderator behind the scenes. We want to mahalo Akaku as always. They're uh, one of our favorites, certainly my favorite. And Shana Decker, who is our communications manager for Maui Moloka'i Lanai and a whole big team behind us that brought us to you tonight. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to our president, Sharon Suzuki, for some closing comments um, and always with aloha. Thank you so much, Mahina, and thank you to the panelists for um, answering those many questions. But, um, and again, thank you to those of you behind the scenes who made this meeting um, possible. So, Moloka'i community, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Uh, we really appreciate your insights into how we can help plan for your island to meet the unique needs of, of your communities. and. Um, as you heard, you know, uh, Becca's willing to go back and have another session to go into more details about uh, community-based renewable energy as she had last year in terms of sharing more about how, if you even wanted to put together a community proposal, what it takes to um, participate in our request for proposal process. So we're always willing to uh, meet on a smaller scale on if you have any suggestions or have a 
group that you belong to that you feel could help contribute to us, we're always interested. And of course, individually or as a business, we always want to hear from you. So thank you again for making the time. Um, you know, this is new, so please provide us feedback even on the format and how we can help better serve you. Mahalo.